that were lined up waiting for transport. They had the Jews lined up. They wouldn't give them water. They wouldn't give them food. And they didn't have any sanitary amenities. And they stood and they stood and they stood while people with rifles around them to put them on trains to go to a concentration camp. Now, if you listen to the news carefully, even the mayor of New Orleans talked about it, that the people that were on that, what was it, I-10 or no. that overpass, they wanted to get off and go and get water and food. But the soldiers prevented them Armed people prevented them from getting off of that overpass. See now, when I was talking to my colleagues in psychiatry, now these are black psychiatrists from all across the country. I have the reputation of, oh here she goes again, <laughs> talking about racism. But more people come to my section Francis, when are you speaking? What are you going to talk about from all of the different sections? They try to schedule me at a time when a lot of people can come because the people always want to come and stay and ask questions. But my colleagues are still very timid. Now see, do we understand that? See, that timidity is related to there is opposition to black people talking about racism. You see, there are all kinds of implied, if not overtly stated, threats. I was a professor at the university, Howard University Medical School, Department of Pediatrics, in 1968 to 1975, and that's where I started writing about racism. I wrote the Crest Theory of Color Confrontation at Friedman's Hospital as assistant professor of the Department of Pediatrics. When I expected promotion and tenure, some of my colleagues, you know the grapevine, so some of my colleagues whispered to me, Francis, you're not going to get promotion in tenure. Now, I was a student at the medical school at Howard. Knew all the professors. Knew the dean. And I said, why? <laughs> <laughs> and so they said, because of your political ideas. So, you know, like a naive young person, I go trotting off to the dean's office and say, you know, I, I'm sure you know that I want promotion in tenure. <coughs> See, this was a former scheduled meeting. He was even tape recording the meeting. And I said, but I hear on the grapevine that I'm going to be denied promotion in tenure because of my political ideas. And I said, what political ideas? And he sat and said, that paper that you wrote. Since I'd only written the one paper. <laughs> and I said, well, what's wrong with the paper? He said, it doesn't make sense for you to say that white people are envious of black people's skin color. And I said, but white people tell me this. I don't ask black people what white people think. And I have all these letters from white people saying when they read the press theory, they would write and say, you're right, I always wish that I had color. I think I have an article here. Turn to the last page. See, time is interesting. Just hang in, <laughs> and the truth will out. You see this article about panning addicts? 
I just have to have a tan, even if I get skin cancer. So anyway, to make a long story short, I was denied promotion and tenure. After that, I became clinical director of what used to be Hillcrest Children's Center. Because after I didn't have a job at Howard, these people hired me, paid me twice as much to work half as long. <laughs> and that was fine. I did a good job at the end of the year. They said, well, we would like you to work full time. And I said, well, okay. Then I got a letter or call from the director of the center. Wait a minute. <laughs> oh. We cannot hire you full time until you bring the board a copy of the press series. See, but I had also had an earlier experience in working at the North Community Mental Health Center, which is right up on Spring Road. And when I decided, well, let me work with the children's program. All the children are black. Let me work with that. But there were no black people in charge of the program. All the psychiatrists in charge were white. And so when I said, okay, I'd like to work in the children's program, and the head of the children's program scheduled a meeting for us to talk about me being hired up on Spring Road. All the children were black, the black community, all the families were black. And he said to me, you have an excellent reputation as a psychiatrist. However, all of our other psychiatrists are white. And you make white people uncomfortable. <laughs> So I just kind of laughed. <laughs> I chuckled and I said, wait a minute, you're telling me that I have an excellent reputation as a psychiatrist, which is supposed to be our job. <laughs> and here we are in a black community, all the patients are black, all the families are black, but I can't be hired because I make white people uncomfortable. <laughs> I said, isn't that funny? <laughs> Fortunately, the head of mental health at that time, that's a long time ago, was one of the black psychiatrists who forced him to hire me. But you understand? You get the picture. See, it's not easy, so I understand black people's nervousness about talking about racism. You see, but I'm a third generation physician. My father was a physician, his father was a physician. Back before 1909 was when my grandfather died. I never knew him. But he was political. His wife, my grandmother, my father's mother, lived with us, grew up. I grew up with my grandmother. And my grandmother would always say, your grandfather was a race man. Your grandfather was a race man. He spent more time outside of his office politicizing the people than he spent in his office. So my grandmother kept saying, your grandfather was a race man. And that term for maybe younger people don't know what it means. How many people know what a race man is? A race man, that was terminology that was used perhaps in the late 19th century and early 20th century to indicate that somebody who was committed to, not committed to being accepted by white people, but being committed to the development of black people. I remember the head of the Department of Pediatrics, because, you know, I guess I was always kind of radical. <coughs> And the chairman of the department said to me one day, he said, Francis, you know, I think you really love black people. <laughs> and I said, that's the best compliment you could give me. You see, because I remember one of my colleagues saying, because I, you know, 
radical young person.